Well, good afternoon. It is just a one minute after two o'clock. So in order to stay with um, our one hour uh, time slot, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome everybody to the In the Swine Barn series with South Dakota State University and Washington State University. I know we have more participants coming in as we're gonna get started here, but in order to take advantage of all the time that we have, we'll get started. I first wanna introduce Jamie Sackman. Um, Jamie's with the Washington Pork Producers. She does our treasure work. Um, she also works with Wolf Kill Feeds and Big Bang Community College. Jamie will be manning the questions and watching the chat box. So if you have a question for Ryan, um, as we go through this um, webinar, be sure to type it in the question and answers and, and we'll make sure that Ryan gets those. If there's for some reason we're having technical difficulty or you have a question about how um, the platform is working, you can go ahead and send those into the chat box. My name is Sarah Smith. I'm with Washington State University. Um, I do animal science work for um, Washington State University Extension as a regional extension specialist. Um, the other um, person that is partnering with me on this program, in addition to Jamie, is Ryan Samuel from South Dakota State University. He'll be our main speaker today. Today, we're going to talk about nursery pig management and talk about processing of those pigs. And so I have a, a poll that I want you guys to take right quick. Um, I'm going to launch the poll. And it says, when do you typically process your baby pigs? We're talking about like castration, tail docking, ear notching, iron shots. Um, if you want to go ahead and click on that and uh, and we can kind of see um, what we're looking at for processing the baby pigs. So kind of what I was expecting, uh, we have a lot of variety of producers. So we have a lot of variety of uh, processing um, preferences. We have everything from some people doing three days to some people doing older than three weeks. So Ryan's gonna step through and talk about um, good production practices for um, managing baby pigs. I'll share your screen, Ryan. You guys see that on the screen? So Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Very good, thank you. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about uh, piglet processing and then some of those nursery pig basics. And so if you'll advance to the next slide, we'll just go through sort of the agenda there on the next one. One moment, I seem like I moved forward and then All right, so if you just want to pull in the agenda. So first we'll talk about uh, piglet IDs, we'll talk about ear tagging or ear notching. Um, then we'll talk about some iron and other medications administering uh, injections. We'll talk about piglet castration. Uh, we'll look at a little video of that. Uh, some of you may have seen that previously, but we just want to revisit that. And then we'll talk through Dr. Toller, uh, who works here at SDSU, has, has a video about uh, nursery pigs and getting them started. And then we'll have some slides that capture some of the information and then follow up with any questions. And again, enter your questions in the Q&A box throughout and we can address those. So. So moving into the next, of course, the focus here on the webinar is to focus on nursery pig management. 
We'll look at how to efficiently and effectively process uh, baby pigs to ensure good health, uh, promote fast growing pigs and produce high quality pork. I'll, ideally everyone will learn the proper techniques for uh, tagging, castrating, ear notching, vaccinations, um, vaccinating baby pigs to minimize stress on the pigs and the handler. So first we'll start with uh, piglet processing. And so you can see there's some of those baby pigs and some of those things we'll look at. So one thing we like to look at is ear tagging and it's a way to identify individual animals. And so for research purposes, we do that on a regular basis. So these are some of our little babies here at our swine education and research facility. And they have, all have individual ear tags. And so with those, we can track those animals from birth through to market for research purposes. The same applies to that for if you were doing genetic uh, research or if you were looking at growth on your own farm, those type of information is, is there and useful for identifying those individual animals. And so again, using ear tags or ear notching that we'll talk uh, through a little bit more. Again, ear notching or other individual ear tagging may be required for show pig animals. And so it's important that everyone knows how to do that. And so you can see on the right hand side, um, the ideal placement of where that tag ends up. So obviously with these little guys uh, is where you're starting to put those tags in and then you wanna put them in the, the center of the ear so they end up when those piglets grow into larger market animals, uh, those tags are still in a good, good placement. So of course with ear tagging, you need two parts of the tag. And so just depicted across the top there is the male and the female part of the tag. And so we've got the male there, which is in this case a piglet square, you might call it. Um, and so we've got one that's unlabeled. And then to the right there is one that you can get laser labeled. And so you can actually get them uh, sequentially numbered, manufactured that way, or you can actually write onto them with a special pen, uh, whatever ID number you're gonna put on them loading those tags into the applicator. And again, there's two across the bottom, uh, one sort of a pliers type, and then there's another one that uh, more spring loaded. So either of those, and there's some other options available. And then the key point there uh, on the right-hand side is that particular pin is for baby pig tags. So having the correct size of pin and the correct applicator for the tags that you have is important. So those, just happen to be all flex depicted in the slide there, but obviously there's different brands that you could get. And so they do not work well with each other. And so you just need to make sure that you have the appropriate equipment for and the appropriate tags you're looking at. So when you're tagging those animals, you've got the tag in the applicator, uh, whether it be that pliers type or, or the other spring loaded type. You wanna hold that animal carefully, okay? So properly restrain the animal. So you can see in the image there depicted how he's holding the animal and kind of looking at the ear and pulling it out. And so that you can see that's where you would put that tag. Then you can see uh, depicted there, another image that looks at where you might, a good placement of those tags. So again, centered in the ear, close to the head. And obviously with those little guys don't have a lot of space, but that's where it wants to, you want it to go. So if you're wanting to get that tag in there, because again, the ear will grow and so well the hole that you made in the ear. And so ideally having those tags close to the center will keep them as long as possible. We'll talk about ear notching. So again, it's a standard system where the litter ID is in the pig right ear and the animal ID is in the pig left ear. So here is a diagram of how those notches are made. And the way that you do those is add up the numbers. And so you'll have, you could have to make a two, you would essentially make two ones. And then you would go from there around the ear to depict first the litter and the, then the animal ID. You wanna make sure that the notches are made deep. So again, if you make notches too small, those will disappear by market weight. And then 
that won't um, you won't be able to see those. So then you need to make sure that the notches are deep enough. And so you can see down at the bottom there where he's ear notching uh, that those animals with the ear notcher. Ryan, how many ones can I make? How many threes can I make um, within each quadrant on that ear? Sure. So you'll make a, a single or you make a double, like two ones before you move on to three. So if you want it to be two, you'll make one, one. But then if you want it three, then you'll make, uh, then it becomes three. And then if you want to go up to six, then it'd be two threes, et cetera. So you'll make two of any one of those uh, to get up to where you're going to. Jamie, Julie Hartz has raised her hand. I can't see hand raises, Sarah. <laughs> I will, I will, uh, Julie, if you can type it in the question and answer, because if I, I don't want to get off of Ryan's screen. Oh, Julie said she's good. Yeah, okay, good deal. Thanks, Julie. All right, so the other impact, important part of with uh, piglets and then uh, and then nursery pigs as well would be administering uh, medications, vaccinations, and with piglets it would be iron. So first point there, um, injections preferred for medications and vaccinations, especially medications when pigs are sick, uh, they're not going to be eating or drinking water. And so giving them an injection uh, is the most efficient way to make sure that they're getting the medication. And then likewise with the iron shots that piglets will get and being born anemic and not enough iron in the sow's milk uh, they'll that's the best method to make sure that they get everyone gets an equivalent dosage so you want to fill the syringe with the iron your medication or your vaccination whatever you're providing and then hold the piglet securely so again you can see in the image there where he's holding that uh, pig securely and then providing the injection uh, in that spot just behind the ear and at a 45 degree angle. So that puts, injects that substance, that medication into the muscle. And so the final point there is there's important to know that there's two main types of injections, one being intramuscular. So that's what he's giving there. And the other type would be a sub Q or subcutaneous injection. And so if you'll just pull up those last final points there. Okay. Um, so that makes a difference on if it's an IM medication and it's supposed to be in the muscle, that's how it's metabolized. If it's a sub-Q injection, then that's how it would be metabolized. So it's important that we recognize and provide the medication in the form, the way the route of administration that it's um, supposed to be used for. So. So moving on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more of those in detail, sort of a comparison. So subcutaneous injections, again, some often shorthand is SQ, um, inject only into clean, dry areas. And you're using the loose flap of skin, either on the flank or behind the ear of a sow, uh, as an example. And the medication goes under just underneath the skin. And so that obviously provides for a much slower uptake of the substance medication rather than an IM injection or an intramuscular injection where those will be the uptake is much greater. So that's where, again, the route of administration becomes important that we're giving the right dose and the right route of administration. So the IM injection, we very most common one use that spot on the neck just behind and below the ear. And the neck area should be used for any of the IM injections. Uh, you don't wanna avoid anything going into the ham or avoid anything going into the loin because that could cause condemnation of the meat cut. Also wanna make sure you're using the proper needle size to ensure the medication is deposited into the muscle where it can be metabolized from there. So a needle selection, 
It's important to use the proper size and length of needle to ensure that the medication is deposited into the correct tissue. So again, as it is, whether you're using an IM injection or a sub-Q injection, this chart uh, gives the recommended needle sizes for IM injections. So the gauge, remembering that the gauge always runs uh, backwards. So you've got the larger number or smaller needles. Uh, those gauges work that way. And then the appropriate length. So you wanna work with the appropriate size of needle for the animal you're working with. And then the final point there to bring up is to remember that if you're using anything with 16 gauge or larger size needles, they should be highly detectable. So in the finisher or breeding stock animals, should it happen that you break off a needle with these highly detectable needles, they could be uh, detected um, at the processing plant or along the, so that they didn't end up on somebody's dinner plate. Um, you should be, if you break a needle off, should be identifying that animal. And if sending, when you're sending that animal to packer, uh, letting them know, and uh, it's most common that they'll pay you out for that animal, but won't use the animal won't end up into the the food supply because that's the most safest way to avoid a, a needle getting through the, the system. So moving on to piglet castration, again, his recommendation is within that first you know three to five days after farrowing, and we want to use clean, sharp equipment which will minimize pain and then this will minimize risk of infection. A uh, scalpel blade is a common tool and as you can see in the picture there, we've got what we use here are curved scalpel blades. And so those will make a good incision and reduce the risk of injury to the personnel. Uh, side cutters can be used again early on in, for castration and just making those in cuts with the side cutters. You want to dip tools and disinfectant between pigs and keep everything clean and reduce infection. As we move forward, um, there may be, uh, there'll be increasing options available for pain mitigation. And so as those become available and viable options, those should be included. And then the last point there is remember if castration must be done uh, later, post weaning, you need to use an anesthetic or analgesic and often the, the vet uh, will be involved in doing that procedure with the larger animals. So the reason we do piglet castration uh, reduces aggressive nature, uh, reduces boar taint and any unintended breeding from having boars in the herd. Again, this is best performed after colostrum intake so after those piglets get a first initial colostrum uptake from the sow and then prior to weaning, which will allow adequate time for the weaned wound to heal. So on the next slide here, uh, we have a video. And so we'll just watch uh, Hannah perform this. Did it go, Ryan? I didn't see it go. So just what you saw in there, yeah, exactly that. Holding that piglet there and then doing those two incisions and then we pull those testicles out one by one and then they're discarded. And then at the end, uh, it's just clipped off the end of the video, but Hannah would spray them with iodine to iodine spray to keep that clean, so. All right, so moving forward here, we're gonna look at uh, nursery pig. And so now that they've been weaned, uh, they'll go into the nursery. And so hopefully we can get this video to come up and then uh, Dr. Toller is gonna talk through um, introducing the nursery pig and some of the 
housing considerations and feeding considerations. And then we'll have some slides to finish that up. Can you guys hear the, can you hear it, Ryan? No, we're not hearing it nor seeing it. Can you hear it, Ryan? We cannot nope. hear it. Okay, I just, need, need I just need to do a new share. Ryan, I'll give you one quick question here why Sarah's, um, uh, oh, never mind, go ahead. You can go ahead, Jamie, I, get, I go ahead and give Ryan the okay. question. Um, a question from John. Um, when you're cutting those pigs, do you pinch and pull or just pull? So you need to hold, be holding on to the, if, if the question is you're holding on to the one while you pull the other, because otherwise they can they can pull through. Um, so you're just kind of yeah pinching that that's the the one you're holding on to and then grabbing and holding on and and pull the other one out. So you're getting as much of the the cord and everything else uh, coming with. Okay, I'll go ahead and start with the, uh, Dr. Toller now. Remember breeding gestation, 114, 115 days of pregnancy, move them over to farrowing, the sow gives birth, 21 days later they get weaned and they come into a nursery. And so that's the next segment that we're going to cover today. And so uh, again in the U.S. we really have two different things, two different types of systems what happen to pigs after they wean. The more traditional one would be they'd be weaned at 21 days of age and we move them into a special nursery building, okay? And they're going to be there six to eight weeks. So again, it's a little better tightly controlled. And then after eight weeks, we'd move them to a finishing barn. And that's about where half the U.S. production is. Uh, and in the last probably 10 to 15 years, we've seen a really big growth of a thing called the wean to finish barn. And actually, if you remember on the first segment, the finishing barn that we saw at our offsite unit is actually a wean to finish barn. So at weaning, they come into that specially designed uh, finishing barn that has auxiliary heat and they stay in those pens till they get market weight. So what we have here in our, in our research farm on, on campus is, is a little bit of both. So this is not what your typical nursery room looks like, but from a research standpoint, we have a lot of pens with, with small pigs. So uh, again, what we want to do, these pigs are basically, this is a wean to finish barn. They're going to stay in here uh, until they get to market weight. So again, producer's number one concern is animal well-being. And, and the things that we, we've always talked about, they need fresh water, they need fresh feed, uh, they need fresh air, and, th and they need a good temperature. And, and that's what we're, what we're gonna do in here. So I'm gonna walk into this pen. Now these pigs actually were weaned uh, a week ago. And so they've been in this room uh, for about a week now. And so as you look at that, uh, again, these baby pigs, they probably like it when it's around, uh, you know, 80, 80 some degrees. And, but again, that's not gonna work really well. And so what we do, we provide a micro environment. So you think back to the fairwing crate, we have the heat lamps and heat pads to provide a micro environment. We do the same thing here with these heat lamps. So if you put your hand under here, it is really pretty warm. And uh, when we first came in here, before they got all excited to see us, uh, a bunch of these pigs were laying under the heat lamp. So again, uh, when they sleep, they sleep under the heat lamp where it's warm. When it's time to get up, eat, and drink, they'll, they'll run around. So we got a really nice micro environment. And we'll keep these heat lamps on as long as the pigs are laying underneath. So basically, we let the pigs tell us when they don't need any more heat. So when you come here in the morning and the pigs are laying in a different area, then we shut the heat lamps off because they're telling us that they don't need it. Again, just like in, in gestation, uh, just like we in the finish barn, these guys are on a slatted floor. The urine and the feces fall through, so they have a nice dry area to go into. Over here, we have the place where they get fresh water. Uh, and that's basically called a cup water. And the really nice thing about cup waters is it stays at this height for the whole pig's life because it's their natural drinking stand. So they're gonna come up here whether they're a 20 pound pig or they're a 300 pound pig. This works really well and there's a lot less water waste. Now the other thing that's, that's really tricky about nursery pigs is the diet, okay? 
And so if you take a look at this diet here, these are really uh, little pellets, okay? And if you remember back to the finishing barn, we, it was just a grind and mix feed, just ground corn and, and soybean meal and DDGS. And the reason why we have these pellets is it's called a transition diet, okay? So on, on day 21, that pig wakes up in the morning, nurses from the sow, it's, it's getting milk proteins, it's getting milk sugars, it's getting immunoglobulins from the sow, uh, really highly digestible protein, and that's the enzymes that it has to break those products down. Uh, we, after they eat, we, we pull them out, we move them into a, into a nursery, and all of a sudden, here's a, here's a cold feeder, here's a cold water, here's these dry things in there, and they don't know what it is. So what this feed does is really mimic sow's milk. Okay, so uh, there's some corn in there, there's some soybean meal, but it's about 30% dried whey, which provides lactose and milk sugar, because that's the, uh, that's the enzymes that the pigs have to do. And we've got some really uh, soy specialty products and some really, maybe some fish meal, uh, things that are very digestible to that young pig, so it can make that transition very smoothly, okay? If we were to come in here and put corn soybean meal in here, a uh, pig doesn't have the enzymes at this early age to digest it. So basically, we've got four different diets that we're gonna feed in this nursery phase because this diet is about $2,000 a ton, so a buck a pound. So maybe for the first uh, four to seven days, they're gonna get this diet, okay? We want them to get on feed, uh, so they start growing. Once they get used to that, we're going to pull out some of that, some of the whey, some of those other expensive, and add more corn and soybeans, so they keep growing. And so uh, we're, we're cheapening up the diet, but still providing the nutrients to get. By the time they get to 25 pounds, it's just going to be a corn soybean meal diet, and and they do really well. So uh, and again, in, in a regular nursery room, uh, you're going to have about maybe. 10 to 20 pigs per pen that might be on a, on a plastic floor. Uh, they stay there six to eight weeks and then go into a finishing barn. Again, this is set up to be a wean to finish barn. And again, in, in a commercial barn, you're not gonna have these little pens like this. You're gonna have a big pen that you might have 25 to 30. So uh, same types of things when it comes to fresh air. If you take a look here, we have our air inlets up on top and, and they're cracked open just a little bit. And so fresh air comes under the eaves, through the roof line, and it drops down through this air. And again, it's a negative pressure system because in our pits, actually, this is about an eight to 10 foot deep pit underneath us where the manure is stored. There's also, we call it a cold weather fan. And that's running 365 days a year, and it creates a vacuum, okay? So the, there's a vacuum, so the fresh air comes in from the ceiling, and you can see there's a air inlet almost over every pen. So that fresh air is continually dropping on these pigs, and the exhaust air in the pit fan is just sucking it down through there. So fresh air comes in, drops on the pig, the, the humid, the, the uh, air that's got some gases and the manure smell gets pulled down through the pit and exhausted through our biofilter. So uh, again, it's, it's pretty amazing. This, this first week, they may not grow very much. Again, they're getting that transition to from mother's milk to these pellets. Once they get on dry feed, they're, they're really going to take off. And again, what's amazing to me, you take a look at these guys, and you know, again, they're probably 15 to 20 pounds, and in five months, they're going to be at 300 pounds. So, and again, we talk about you know 2.4 pounds of feed per pound of gain. So it's pretty incredible how they can take corn and soybean meal very efficiently and turn it into a great pork product. Okay, so again, if you remember, one of the first things we talked about is biosecurity and keeping these pigs healthy, right? And so we, again, in pork production, we do a thing called all-in, all-out production. So a week ago, uh, on, on Friday morning, actually, this room was totally empty, and it was clean and had been disinfected and dried down, so it was, it was ready to go. And then Friday morning, we pulled all these pigs out from the sows, from the farrowing room, and moved them in here. So that whole farrowing group, everybody came in here. The good pigs, the average pigs, and, and the small pigs. And then we shut the door and no more pigs are coming in. So again, pigs only get, get diseases from other pigs and people. And so when we bring them in all at one time from one source and close the door, 
there's no other new pigs coming in here, so they're not going to get a disease from any other pigs. And when we come in here, we're going to shower in, leave our dirty clothes on one side of the shower, shower in, put on these, these really fine, fancy clothes, and, and work the pigs, okay, and do chores and those kinds of things. So we're not bringing diseases in, in anywhere else. So again, the challenge that we have, those we have pigs of different sizes. The first pen that we looked at was a pretty nice group of pigs. They're going to take off, no problem. Uh, now you take a look at this pen, and, and they're just a little bit smaller, okay? They're, they're healthy. You can see they, they still look pretty good, but they're smaller. And so one of the things that we do, we talk about that phase one diet. That's a lot of milk and really high quality protein sources. The first pen that we looked at might only get that diet for four days because their body can handle that next transition. These little guys over here, they might be on it a week or a little bit longer because, again, just to, that extra care to get them where they can handle being switched to that next diet. So they, they look a little smaller, uh, but once on the right diet in this really good environment, they're going to take off. Uh, the other thing is, again, we, we want to keep it warm in here, and you see these heat lamps, uh, but the other thing that we do, we've got an, an LB white propane heater. And so this keeps, this is what really keeps the air temperature about that 72 degrees, okay? And so it, it goes on and off, it's on that thermostat and, and keeps a, a constant 72 degrees in here. And actually what's really kind of amazing as these pigs get older, you know, by the time these pigs get to be, you know, 40 pounds, except in the wintertime, that heater's not going because they produce so much body heat and this barn is really well insulated. We've got about, you know, a foot of insulation, eight to 12 inches of insulation on the top. These walls are insulated. We've got insulation in a concrete, so we're, we're not wasting heat. And so actually, we all the only thing we do for ventilation, we bring the ventilation in to take out the stale air and the moisture, and uh, and so it works out really pretty cool. So again, this, this whole heating system, it's a combination of LB white heaters and heat lamps, but again, just like that finishing barn, we can keep this barn within a two degree temperature swing. So again, it can be in January, minus 30 degrees, degrees out and it's going to feel like this. It's going to be 72 degrees in here and we can bring these baby pigs in and, and they do great. The only thing that would be different, so let's say we're in a, in a commercial finishing barn, a wean to finish barn, what we would do, we would probably take uh, a particle board, like a straw board or something like that, and we would lay it on the floor in front of the feeder and there instead of an electric heat lamp, they would have an infrared uh, propane heater that would heat that whole uh, particle board up. And the, the biggest challenge that we have is how do, how do we get baby pigs to figure out how to eat, okay? Because they're used to drinking milk with Mama Sal calling them. So on that particle board, we'd come through every morning and just take a hands full of feed and throw it out on there. Because, and we do that about five to six times a day because pigs are really curious. So we come in there, they jump up and run around and we throw those pellets on there and they'll go over and start nosing and one is gonna start eating and the others figure that out. So that's how we get started on feed. And, and the reason why we use a particle board like that or a, a straw board is from a disease standpoint. So again, when, when these guys are gone, Everything's taken out of here. Uh, it's, it's our, all, the, all the feed's gone, but we clean and disinfect everything. And we used to use rubber mats, okay? Because we could use them from time and time again. But, so we had the rubber mats in here. Even though we clean and disinfect them, uh, we're not sure they're 100% clean, right? So we could still carry that disease in. So what most commercial barns are gonna use is that particle board. And as the pigs get bigger, they just chew on it, it breaks down, falls in through the slats and the manure, dissolves, and then we just put it out on the field. So again, it's, it's a pretty interesting system, but for whatever we do, you know, animal oil being is, is the first thing that we come through. So again, I, I know it's been a, probably a long spring for you guys at home. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you out in the field right now helping with calving or, or doing some other fun things, but we really hope that you're enjoying this segment about pigs. And again, just one way of SDSU's College of Ag, Food and Environmental Sciences, trying to help out. And again, uh, when you're looking at doing something uh, post high school, we really hope that you'll you'll come to SDSU. It's a great place, and you'll become one of the proud Jackrabbit families. So again, thanks. I hope life is going well for you, and, and go big, go blue, and go Jacks.
let me go back to our PowerPoint here. Ryan, I'll throw another question at you. Um, so the, uh, mentioned that there that the starting feed is about a third way. If you're trying to keep your budget in line, can you mix powdered milk in with their feed to help on transition or any other suggestions um, on that feeding phase? Sure. So that, as Dr. Teller said, so that those phase one, phase two diets would have those milk products in there. And so anything that you could put in there that, again, cost effectively, um, milk transition products would make sense uh, to do so. And so if when we get to the slides, we might look at some of the enzyme development and you'll see why um, in those later phases will drop out those milk products. Uh, again, as lactase or the enzyme that breaks down the lactose uh, begins to fade away, um, then putting those products in the diet no longer is is no longer helpful. And so, yeah, if you can find a product that you can put in early on on those phase one, two diets, that would make sense. Great, thank you. Did I get to the right slide, Ryan? That looks great, yeah. So if you'll just pull up those uh, points there. So as Dr. Toller just talked, um, the nursery pig is again on the sow um, and to, given the access to, you know, probably 16 meals per day. Um, and it's, it's, it's a nice liquid diet, nice and warm, uh, come from mom. Okay, nice, warm, healthy. Uh, and you got milk protein and milk sugars that are provided from the, that liquid diet from the sow. Um, you get immunoglobulins from the sow. So again, that's a pass immunity from uh, sow or from dam to the piglets. And they get that call for supper. So you've got everyone uh, comes at the same time, eats. And so there's that recognition of, oh, it's meal time, I should, I should go eat. If we look at the after weaning side of things, uh, here you've got feed in a feeder. So again, that's a foreign way to eat for those piglets. It's dry, um, it's cold, less than body temperature. Um, it's, so it's gonna, often gonna be a grain-based diet. So completely different than the warm milk that they were just consuming. Uh, they have to chew that, so it's a hard diet. And then the question becomes, where's the water? So um, because it's dry, uh, water comes from a different place. It's no longer an all-in-one like the sow milk was. And so then piglets have that difficult time transitioning over to a new diet. So it's moving on to the next slide. We can look at this figure just gives us um, an indication. So coming from colostrum over there on the, in the first peak, that's the antibody protect, protection that the piglets get. Again, transfer from the sow to the piglets uh, in those first few hours. And that's the importance of colostrum. Those pig, piglets get anti -product, antibody protect, protection from the mom. That begins to fade away as those piglets get older. And then at weaning time, there's very little of that maternal protection left. And so their internal immune system has to begin to ramp up and build those, those antibodies. And so that's again, the importance of weaning and the temperature and the environment, avoiding drafts, all those type of things that we do with those young weaned pigs in order to keep them from being sick because they have a a mature, immature immune system that's developing um, the antibodies and ultimately protecting them. So in the next uh, figure that we'll look at, this is the digestive development. And so you can look at how things like lactase, so I touched on that a little bit earlier. So that breaks down your milk sugars. And so you can see it's very high when those piglets are with mom drinking milk, which makes sense. But then as time progresses, that production of lactase begins to decrease. And so that's where you start make, taking the milk products out of the diet because they're no longer digestible. So it causes more harm than good. And then similarly, you can see some of the other enzymes that are begin, pr production begins to ramp up as the 
as the piglet ages. And so we adjust the diets appropriately. So protease, which breaks down proteins and then other enzymes break down different sugars. And so you can see there, we got the label of phase one, phase two, uh, phase three diets, which correspond to this graph here. Uh, figure here, we're looking at those diets on the table. And so we can look at some of the ingredients um, there. And so looked highlighted in, in blue. So in the first point, so if you'll look at those specifically, those are the specialty protein products. And so they're highly digestible and have are good for the pigs so they can digest those and grow and get the, get the protein and energy that they need uh, coming from the diet. So, so just protein. So then the next one I'll look at, we'll highlight the next um, box, bring up the next box, please. So choice white grease you may find in the diet. So again, that provides a lot of energy in the diet and that's very readily digestible by the animal. So they can use that readily for their energy needs. And this uh, table would look at the, some of those phase feeding recommendations. So again, as Dr. Toller said in the video, depending on the size of that pig when they're weaned, the amount of phase one or phase two diet may change. So again, based on this, the, the size of the animal and then the age of the animal, how much of those early transition diets they will require before they can actually consume uh, the other diets that would have less of those specialty protein products and fewer of the, the milk products. So again, those products are expensive um, and that's what makes those diets so expensive. And so moving away from those expensive diets as efficiently as possible, if you will, uh, makes most economic sense. So pigs must find feed and water within the first 36 hours. That's really the important point to make there is that they must find feed and water. Otherwise um, they won't make it through life, uh, if you will. So they must be able to find feed and water. And so we wanna make sure that the water nipples are at the right height. So doing that to adjust those water nipples to the height of the shoulder on the smallest pig or when you're, and then also with that, related to that is the next point about water flow. So we wanna make sure that we have the correct water flow and water flow is more important than water quality we found in recent research. So the flow of water can allow those uh, pigs to consume enough water and then that's tied directly to feed intake. So when they're getting enough water, then they can eat feed. And when they're eating feed, they're gonna go back for more water. And so those are directly tied together. So we wanna make sure that they can get adequate water and one of the ways you can do that to introduce those pigs is to block open the nipples or tie open the nipples for the first 24 hours so the pigs can access and see where water comes from and then learn to drink from there. Then the last point up there is if you're using a watering pan as we see in the image there, I wanna make sure you clean that on a regular basis. So ideally daily dump that, clean it and put in fresh water for everyone to uh, get clean, fresh water. So the next picture uh, we can see is on the top there is a couple of piglets drinking from water nipples. And so this is kind of a unique setup where there's two different heights of those water nipples in the pen. So you can see the guy in the front there uh, kind of reaching forward. And then the other guy is reaching up a little bit to reach that secondary nipple. And so that allows those uh, pigs of different size in the pen to access those. And then as Dr. Toller said, you've got that drinking cup, which reduces water wastage and allows pigs for everything from those fresh newly weaned pigs that you see in the picture there up to market pigs, um, be able to access water uh, through that same drinking cup uh, without any adjustments required. So again, if a pig is dehydrated or not eating and within the first 36 hours, that's that critical window, window what you can do is mix water and wa and feed together and that forms a gruel. So you can see in the image there, he's put feed in the this little supplementary feed pan and then he's adding water to it, what 60% feed and 40% water. And you can, that those when those pigs go for that, um, that is good and tasty. And so they'll take that. 
And then you can also do that to feed them. So using a syringe, you can place some of that gruel in the pig's mouth and then place the pig next to the feeder. So they can start to associate feed, water coming from the feeder. One of the reasons for doing this, of course, is to keep that, get that piglet on a good start. And what that means is if they get a good start and they gain some weight in that first week, uh, they'll be most efficient to market. If they don't gain in that first week, you can add 10, 20 days extra to market weight before they achieve market weight. So next we can talk about some feeding mats. And so you can see there, that's uh, a mat that is in the, in the wean to finish barn. And so that mat that again, Dr. Toller talked about, uh, you can put feed on that on the left-hand side there about four to six times per day for the first few days. And you'll see that pigs will be curious and they'll go up and nibble on that. And so they'll start to learn to eat that feed and start to adjust. And then if you're using a feed pan or a feed trough or something uh, like in the image on the right, that sort of a housing system, uh, you wanna make sure that's kept clean with no manure, urine, straw, et cetera, the foreign matter uh, in there. So that's nice and clean with water and for feed. So we talked about the microenvironment, and so we want to provide a good microenvironment for those pigs. So again, it's warm in the room, and then we can use heat lamps or radiant heaters, gas-powered radiant heaters, to keep those piglets warm. And so these are some guys here in our off-site uh, Wiener Finish Barn, and you can see they're utilizing that radiant heat and seem to be quite comfortable in that space. So I was able to walk up to them and uh, and get a picture of them without them noticing because they're uh, well, well and asleep in that, that space. So on the other hand, if we look at the next image, we've got the same setup, um, different situation, a group of pigs. And you can see that these pigs are avoiding that heater. So you can kind of see it directly around, we're everywhere around that ring uh, where the heater would be. And those piglets have formed a ring around it. So they are enjoying, they, they, they like to be warm, but not so hot that they're right underneath it. So we turned those brooders down and lifted them up a little bit higher. And then they were starting to use the, that space underneath. So ideally what we wanted is to have that warm space right underneath the brooder on the black mats, but we were fine. We found in this case with the, then, and if you pull up the, the, the bar there that tells us again, watch the pig. And they tell you everything you need to know. So we're just watch the animal behavior and realize that we needed to make an adjustment there. So in the next slide, of course, uh, we're always that cautionary tale. Remember if you're using straw or wood chips, um, there's that risk of fire with uh, heat lamps. So you wanna make sure that pigs can't reach them and don't have any electrical issues and those aspects as well. So make, keep everybody safe. So just to summarize, we talked about piglet IDs. So whether that be ear tags or ear notches, um, that allows you to track production, you can track health, you can track genetics. Um, again, those may be required for show pigs in your area. And so it's important to follow the protocols for those. Injections, and it's important to know the difference between intramuscular or subcutaneous injections. Using clean equipment, uh, you want a sharp needle and changed often and then using the proper needle size for the injection, for the size of animal, make sure you're either getting the end of the muscle or just below the skin, depending on the medication that you're working with. As far as piglet castration, wanna make sure you're using clean, sharp equipment to make efficient cuts and reduce pain and infection. And then you wanna complete piglet castration uh, after colostrum and before weaning, ideally. So we talked about the microenvironment of the nursery pigs. You wanna use heat lamps and supplemental heat until it's not needed. And again, watching the pigs to tell you when that happens uh, is, is best because the pigs know best what they like for their environment. And again, avoiding drafts or anything else in that, uh, in their, as far from ventilation I want to make sure those pigs have the good microenvironment to grow and start uh, getting onto feed and water. 
So we're using things like pelleted feed that gives pigs good access to, to feed and a good transition because uh, it has everything within a single bite, within a single pellet of the diet. And so they can consume that. We provide those feeds and whether it be phase one, two, three, four, uh, up through the, the phase feeding uh, as it goes, provide for digestive development. So we match the diets to as the enzymes and the pigs develop. And then with water access, we want to block those open for 24 hours to allow those pigs to find out where water comes from and learn to drink. One of the things that we do uh, at our barns to look at that, because we all have cup waterers, is we'll block those open for the first 24 hours. Then when, we, when they're not blocked open anymore, we'll just watch. And if a cup waterer doesn't have water sitting in it, then we'll refill it until somebody learns to add, open the nipple and get water into the cups and then we we'll, can leave them go because as long as somebody can has figured out how to nose the, the nipple then uh, there's water in the cups and everyone has access. If you have nipple waterers you need to adjust the height and remember uh, flow is important. So critical that pigs uh, find feed and water within the first 36 hours in order to get on to a good start and uh, get a good be a, big, a good pig. So with those are the end of the slides. So I'll um, end there. And if there's any questions, we'll, we'll address those. Another question for, um, for, the, to, for you to answer, Ryan, for the group. Um, so we're, we're moving, moving our harvesting time up to five or six months on these pigs. So why do we still need to castrate males if we're getting them harvested at such a young age? The reason is that you've still got a percentage of those that will come into sexual maturity and that boar taint issue uh, becomes still, still is a problem. So if we look at places like the EU, European Union, um, they will, and, and Australia or New Zealand, uh, they will have lower slaughter weights. And in those, some of those countries, they will not castrate thinking for the fact that Again, for that exact reason, if we slaughter them early enough, we don't have a, a bortane issue, and yet they do. And so you'll have a certain percentage of animals that will have a bortane issue, and then that can put consumers off. Um, and that would, so that you've got the, the not, not a quality eating experience, obviously, if you uh, come across that. So the, the weight that they can achieve sexual maturity um, and the likelihood that they will when they're still even at five, six months old here in the, the US or Canada uh, would be high enough that we still need to castrate. And also those, um, when they're intact males are harder for us to handle. So there's more issues for on the human side as well as um, with, within the hogs themselves. And another thing, um, kind of on a similar line, and it's probably more of a problem in show pig lines, but would you talk briefly about what crypt orchids are and how to handle those? Sure. So yeah, we'll use off terms like the, the the one nutters or or retained testicles or or those type of things. Yeah, exactly. So um, those guys are are a problem. Um, what you can do so if you are doing them early on, as far as castration, um, you can leave them, set them aside, and 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 if you only find one, hope that the other one descends. Um, otherwise, you end up with going to have to a, a surgical um, intervention that you can actually that testicle never descends so you're gonna have to go and get somebody to uh, either surgically remove it or hope that it might descend uh, later and so sometimes a later castration uh, you'll they'll actually see them do that so and I've also seen them just where you separate them so if you don't have a um, you're not going to your general market but maybe that's the one that you know goes in your own freezer that kind of thing um, another question, um, we raise chickens and have, and occasionally give eggs to pigs. Is that okay? Sure, yeah, no, there's no reason uh, not to. Yeah, so pigs being omnivores, they'll eat lots of everything. So yeah, that, that was a good supplement to a diet, sure. Probably same general uh, food safety rules as anything else in terms of salmonella, those type of things. But other than that, we're good. That's all the specific questions I have um, sitting from the um, participants, unless someone else has something else. So 
So Ryan, on those crypto orchids in the industry, what is the percentage in our commercial industry that we see a crypto orchid? That's a fair question. I don't have a, my finger on the number of, of what it would be. Um, not very high, uh, would, mm -hmm. would kind of be where, 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 what I would say, um, mm -hmm. but I don't have a good number for that. And then obviously there's, you know, looking at genetic lines and uh, if it's tied back directly to a, a bore, they uh, aren't used for very long in the industry. So uh, those would be some of those intervention, interventions that would, would happen. Yeah, I, the reason I was asking, as Jamie pointed out, is show pig, we see it a little bit more, but I have had situations and I, it wasn't even a retained uh, testicle, but we had either a late castration or partial testicle out. And the pig did not, the pigs don't show up at the fair as a problem so much. But when you get them in the cooler, you can smell the boar taint. And then we have an unhappy uh, processor. We have an unhappy consumer. So the key to good castration um, is critical because even if you, it doesn't act bory or look bory, um, when we get into that, that processing, we've still found enough to cause that boar taint and issues. At least we have it in our fair with a couple times I've been called in on, on pig issues. And it looked really like they were either castrated late or didn't get all the testicle cord out. And that was enough to cause some not strong boar taint, but some boar taint. And I've been involved with multiple carcass contests where you have an animal that's live and they're, um, they're harvested there as part of the fair. Um, almost always, if you're around the guys who bring on hogs a lot, they're like, there's one here somewhere. And sure enough, they find it as soon as they get in the cooler. So a um, question along the same line. So if we do have one of those, how, um, at what age size would we need to get them harvested to know we did not have a problem with um, boar taint? Sure. So again, going back to my answer earlier. So if we talk about some of those countries that harvest them at uh, 100 kg, so two, or 220 pounds, um, that's the reason they do that is to avoid that as much as possible. So that would be my answer. I guess what I would say there is is they'd har have to be harvested pretty early in order to reduce significantly reduce the chance of of boar taint. Yep, and we've always uh, said those are good party pigs. So the, I don't know, 150, 180 pounders that you roast the whole pig on the on the spit and have a party, right? Yeah, it sounds like a perfect use for them. Exactly, right. Good. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. And I audit, uh, obviously we're talking pigs today, but I know some situations with uh, cattle in particular, but I'm sure it can happen in lambs also where if you're banding those animals, make sure, again, you get that whole testicle down or if you leave a piece in there, you, it's, there's still enough um, hormone to cause some problems. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, as a fair judge, I've caught a many crypt orchids in the lamb industries and they say, well, we castrated them. And I'm like, you did get the, you did get the scrotum, you just didn't get the testicles. <laughs> Minor issues, right? Yeah, <laughs> and when they're little, they're little, so, so. Any other questions? I think we did really well on our timeline this time, guys. We are in our hour. Well, there's um, one there's question some nice that came up here. Um, deworming, when do you think we should do our first deworming on pigs? So, well, if you're housed outside, obviously you're gonna wanna do that uh, fairly early and regular on. And I don't know specifically to the product, um, but I would, you know, want to do that um, early on so that they can uh, have the most most effective uh, for that. So yep. commercially, we'll do the same. Uh, if, you know, if we bring new gilts in, um, then they're going to be five, six months old by the time they're they're coming into a, a barn. We might do that, uh, do that coming in. So um, kind of a mixed answer there. I'm not sure that I can put a finger on exactly when. It depends a lot and it also depends on what, what parasites you have problems with because internal and external are two different things. Um, the other one, Ryan, you might talk briefly about um, weaning sows just prior to um, farrowing and the benefits of that. So, sorry, what weaning sows for, what was the uh, question again? Wor sorry, worming sows just prior to um, uh, farrowing. I was wondering what you were asking, Jamie, with the weaning. <laughs> worming, weaning, yeah. <laughs> there you go, that makes sense, yeah. So yeah, so worming those, yeah, deworming those sows, giving those 
that product just in, in the fire and crate. Yeah, definitely a, a good time to do that. Um, so then you don't have any pests onto the, the piglets and uh, get them, everybody going back into the, uh, in, in the herd, Kate, and so you can get the, the greatest effectiveness and, and of, of that, yeah. Ryan, in the swine, is it the same as like in uh, sheep and cattle, but if you give it right prior to worming or, or worming, I'm doing the same thing. If you give, if you deworm right prior to parturition or right after parturition, because of the hormone, we get a better clean out of parasites. Is that the same in pigs? I believe that to be true. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe because of the, the everything connection there, like you say, yeah, that, that, that seemed to be true. Yeah. Yeah. So not only are they in a, a location, you can get them easily, but it typically seems that you get a better, um, effective, uh, um, response to your deworming. So that's another good reason to do it. Any other questions, Jamie? That's it. Good deal. Well, Ryan, I thank you for being with us. It's uh, now five o'clock in uh, South Dakota. So as they say, five o'clock somewhere. Uh, we still have another couple hours of work here in, in Washington state, but we greatly appreciate you guys uh, being in touch with us. I think next May, in May, we're doing training of show pigs, correct, Ryan? Sure. Yep. I think that will be. The I think next that's thing, on yeah. our schedule. It's either right. that's going to be May or June. We might switch it up a little bit, but we'll uh, pitch hit back and forth between the youth producers and our adult producers. Uh, we thank you guys for the filling out our surveys and helping us uh, identify topics and make sure that we um, develop this platform uh, to work best for you guys. We appreciate the kind comments and the critique critique criticisms um, to make it better. So with that, everybody have a happy Friday and uh, have a good week. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, thanks guys. I think it was, we did really good on time now, that time. Not that it's bad when we go over, but um, it's nice when we can keep it in, in our hour. So we were right there at an hour. True, and, right. So, yeah, Ryan, I mean, um, do you want me to call a Zoom meeting to kind of line out what our, what our schedule should be or what are you thinking for May? We probably should, maybe I'll call a Zoom meeting with the group of us so we can do May, June, and July, kind of get those in order of what we want to do for the next three months. Yeah, yeah, we should. So no, that would be good. So um, the May one, I know specifically, I won't be available. Okay. And then we had kind of bounced around the idea for July, I think being the, um, that were the, the videos that uh, Brady, our livestock judge, and his crew had put together for on the show pig fitting and uh, information just before your show season. Was that kind of where we were at with that? Yeah, we can do that. So we'll do that in June. You want to do the show pig and fitting June was, or July? June or I was, I, July is what I was, yeah, just okay. before. Yeah. Yeah, we can do, do that June or July. Um, I know a real popular one will be AI. And I don't know, what's, what's your guys' thoughts on, on that? Do you want to tackle that or do we want to see if one of the industry people tackle it or Tim Safra invite Tim Safransky to do it? But I think AI would be one of big interest. True, yeah. No, I know we had it on the, on, on the list. Um, um, that might, so yeah, let me, um, I always have to check. The schedule here, of course, all the time to see where we because our our batch farrowing where we are on on yeah. uh, getting that. Is, is Paul AI and Sarah? I've been Paul out there recently. Klingeman. Klingeman, yeah. I don't know if he is or is, and I suspect he might be bringing in some new genetics that way. Um, and you know, I'd also say you know we can also invite somebody on, like you know, Tim Sir Francis come out and did our AI um, trainings. We could do, actually, when it comes to pigs, we probably do need to do two, one on the actual AI and one on, you know, the boar, getting the boar and the females already um, sinking and that stuff. I don't know. I don't know. We, we can talk about that, but um, 
I'll look at the, our schedule and we can kind of, and you know, may we might bring, we could maybe bring in even the CRISPR technology um, or have Ernie talk about what the net research at the National Pork Board or something like that. Um, if we, if we need more time um, until we get to the AI and the show pig one. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, we'll all look over that and I'll call a Zoom meeting probably next week. Sometime next week, I'll put on, I'll send out a Doodle poll and we'll do a, a quick Zoom meeting amongst yep. us and just hammer out this schedule again. No, but the the evaluations are coming on really good. And we had a, we had a, um, we're without a secretary um, because one took a new opportunity to go back to school but we just got a new one hired. And so as soon as she gets on, because I am not good on our um, web, I'm gonna have her take and put all these, uh, download all these recordings and we'll put them on our animal ag website so people can then reaccess them at any time and you can share those that way. So, but it was just with the transition of a secretary, it was just gonna be more cumbersome to do it. Um, to, well, I wouldn't get it done. That's that's the reality. I would have screwed up the website um, type of deal. So we'll start logging those on there too. But yeah, no, there's, you know, I've had people come back and ask for the farrowing one. And so we'll just put those on there and then those can link. And then I share them on Facebook too. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Yep. Awesome. And anything else? And are those evaluations working for you? What you need, Ryan, for your for South Dakota State and your impacts and stuff? Yes, no, yeah, very, been very good that way. So no, appreciate you getting those through. So, yep. Perfect, perfect. Well, you guys have a good weekend. I'm um, gonna get on an another Zoom here in 22 minutes, so. All right, lucky you, right. I know, <laughs> the never ending yeah. Zoom. Yes.